All right. Uh, good afternoon. We are from Deloitte Consulting. My name is Jane Chung, and this is my amazing team up here, Kyle Coleman, Brianna Carrier, and Camille Daly. And today we are here to present our implement implementation strategy for using the $100,000 grant money for the Department of Veterans Services. So a quick outline of our agenda today, we're going to be going over through what our proposal is, um, as well as the the problem we're trying to uh, resolve, the timeline, requirements for making the project successful, stakeholder analysis, performance measurements, a risk analysis, and finally a conclusion. So our proposal um, for using the grant money is called Veterans First. And our tagline is to ensure the highest quality benefits for those who have served the highest honor. So a quick executive summary. The problem we're trying to address is the current Medicaid enrollment process is inefficient and overburdened. And we're seeking to implement an identifying and referral process that can better uh, serve the veteran population. Our approach uh, focuses on a two-tiered approach in achieving cost savings and streamlining the Medicaid process. The first approach is a reactive approach. Our targets are veterans currently in the Medicaid system in which we'll use an automated interface system using the Medicaid application and the PAIRS program, um, in which Brianna will um, explain just in a moment. The second approach to our program is proactive, and our target are non-Medicaid beneficiaries seeking medical assistance, but who are veterans. And through that, um, our project will focus on community outreach campaigns. So I'll turn it over to Brianna, who will walk you through the interface. Thank you, Jane. So this following flowchart here kind of highlights the simplicity of our Veterans First interface. The whole point that we got from our meetings with clients was that efficiency was key and that streamlining the process was key. So it doesn't look very complicated, but that's part of the strength that we have here. So if you are a veteran and you are applying or reapplying for Medicaid benefits, and so they start up here at the top, veteran. You apply for Medicaid online, our Veterans First interface system, which is built into the program already existing, uh, relays the applicant's information to the DVS. So from the DVS, Department of Veterans Services, it is their job then, and this is a program that we're implementing, to outreach to that veteran to refer them to VA benefits. The VA then enrolls them just like they would any other, vener any other veteran. And then the ultimate end goal is that our costs are redirected from state to the federal level. So that's the cost part of this, cost effective. Also the public benefit is that resources are opened up for state funding. And then also better community or better customer service because our customers are veterans and they deserve uh, a more streamlined process. So this is how it would work if somebody were enrolling online. It's very simple, very quick. The next part of this process would be, uh, we got this from the Department of Community Health that their process would, that currently is built off of paper. So it's essentially a digital paper process. So to try and make things easier on them, we're gonna ask just one extra step of them here. So instead of just the applying online, smaller process, this one's just one step further. And the veteran here, if they have to apply on paper, the DCH is simply making a commitment to enter the application into the regular Medicaid system. They don't have to input anything extra. The, our interface, Veterans First, is already built into the existing system, and it's completely automatic. So then Veterans First catches the application, identifies them as a veteran. They are referred over to Department of Veterans Services, and again, the process starts veterans are enrolled in VA benefits, and then our end goal is once again reached. So this is the reactive approach for veterans who are already in Medicaid system and those who may be re-enrolling yearly. So we'll move right along from there. Okay. In order for this to work, we have some key program assumptions. We're gonna need a lot of buy-in from our stakeholders that we're gonna talk about in a minute. So one of the things we need is total enthusiastic participation from stakeholders, which we got from the Department of Veterans Services. They're very excited to work with DCH on this project. Um, we are gonna be hiring a programmer who's able to successfully emulate the Washington model um, that our state needs. So we're gonna be adding on to that model for veterans specifically. Um, another requirement is that we're gonna reach our benchmark, benchmarks according to our timeline. So we do have a set, set of goals that we are aiming at. And also a key requirement is that our campaign is effective enough that our veterans are receptive to the idea of enrolling in VA benefits and that they are, see the veteran benefits as an added benefit, not just lower service. 
Okay, so how does this work? So we broke it down into two, multiple phases, but two primary phases. For the reactive phase, we have the first 90 days, which we then split into uh, the first 30 days, uh, within the first 60 days, and then the first 90 days. In the first 30 days, we anticipate sending out um, a, a bid for uh, programmers to be able to bid into the project, you know, to open it up. But we also are relying on the expertise of Bill Allman from Washington to guide us, since he has successfully um, participated in emulating this program to multiple states, over 30 currently. We believe he may actually know a programmer who's familiar enough with the system who could almost instantaneously integrate our state's information with the program. During the first 30 days as well, we will be meeting with stakeholders. It's very important that we're all on the same page. Um, the stakeholders here would be the um, HIC, the uh, DVA, the DCH, the DBS, um, as well as Bill Allman and the programmer. Uh, moving on to the next uh, timeline of 31 days to 60 days. By that point, we hope to have the program complete and installed. And we know this is aggressive, but because they have continuously modeled this program to fit with other states, they've done the work for us. They've worked out the kinks. The programmer understands how to apply it to our state. Um, once it is then completed at the 31 day mark, we then begin to train DCH employees and DBS employees. And it's important for DCH employees to be trained on the system as well, in case any veteran does a paper application and needs to um, have their veteran status kicked over to DBS. From the 61 day to 90 day mark, um, that is when the program goes live. And it's an exciting time. So up until the 90 day mark, HIC is the program manager for this. After the program goes live, by that point, the DVS director should be trained and familiar enough with the program to take it out of the hands of HIC and run it um, by himself. Um, and then after the 90 day period, after the program's gone live, that's where we go into the proactive approach and reactive approach. And the proactive approach, like um, was mentioned earlier, is the community outreach component. So here's just a visual of showing the stakeholder analysis. These stakeholders have very different goals in mind, but they all have one similar goal, which is to streamline the process and to help veterans. And just to reiterate again, the 90 day mark is crucial because there is a change of power, a change of direction, and we're going to do everything that we can to make sure that the director of DVS is prepared at the 90 day mark to take over um, from the HIC. So now for the budget. So how are we plan to spend the 100,000 to achieve our goals? Uh, first, the pair system is already mandated, so we don't expect to have to spend money to buy it or to bring it up to speed. Um, hire a programmer to build the application on top of Paris that uses the Paris information to send out the automated emails or texts or uh, send automated calls, give us information about those veterans. Uh, programmer support, so we're paying a thousand a month just as sort of an external client, if you will. So if there are some issues that we need to call them about that we can, we still have that resource there. Uh, training, traveling recruitment campaign, which is um, basically sending out our PR team to go to local VFWs or wherever we might find veterans to pitch this uh, new approach we're going to this show, to tell them about VA benefits and how if they're on Medicaid, they might actually be eligible for VA instead, which it tends to be um, more focused to their needs. Uh, social media campaign, we're gonna hire uh, maybe a graduate assistant or a couple students to help run our um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of those things. So we're getting the digital aspect of it as well. Uh, and then you see advertising and miscellaneous costs just in case something goes over. Um, here is our enrollment uh, projected goals. So for the first year, you can see that the first uh, 90 days we're just developing the program so nobody's coming online through that. And then it starts off slowly, but it starts to really pick up. Um, we're not going to see that really drastic growth all the way, but you know, once it starts to catch on, we think it'll be pretty solid growth. Once people start to hear about it, once we get the kinks out of our system. Uh, here is our projected 10-year outlook for um, the enrollment value. So you see just really fast growth first, which makes sense as people learn about it, but once you hit the seven, eight year mark, a lot of people who are going to switch over have already done it. And so the people who have it are probably going to be really tough to convert over. 
Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, this is the projected savings. So this takes into account the last graphs, but it also adds in the change um, in federal assistance, so it goes from 90 to 80%. And that's for the first year. You can see it really ramps up at the end as enrollment gets going. Um, it's the same over 10 years. Again, growth quickly at the beginning as this program comes online, as we are aware of all those veterans, the you know 80% using the sample out of the um, you know, total portion of veterans on Medicaid, that block right there we're targeting, and this program allows us to target them. <coughs> yeah. And here is a risk analysis, so what do we think we have going for us, and what do we think could be some issues? Uh, we've already used the model, it's already out there in Washington that worked before, uh, but as far as us, we do have a smaller staff, so that's why we're relying on using the grant to try to automate a lot of this so that we don't have to have uh, long-term staffing costs. Uh, opportunities is that not only is it good for our bottom line financially, but it's also getting veterans to the VA services that are more equipped to handle them, but more personalized to fit them, uh, which is part of that double bottom line. And the threats, um, you know, what if veterans aren't receptive to it? What if they like the, the care they have right now? We're not forcing them to move over. So even though you know, data might show that VA care would be better for them, if they know what they're doing right now and they like it, maybe they don't want to switch over. Um, and on the other hand, if there's overwhelming response, then that could be a drag on our resources. And Camille will wrap it up. So basically with this program, the small cost of $100,000, this state has the opportunity over 10 years to save $266 million with that being $45 million in the first year alone. That's a lot of savings for the state. Um, most importantly though, the services for veterans can be improved. And all this can be done because the state is veterans first. And we'd like to take any questions you may have. I'm a little bit confused about, I understand the interface and the information being sent, who's actually getting that information and making the outreach to the veterans and do they need to staff up? I didn't see any sort of, um, about who would actually take that information. Right, so the system will identify if you, you know, check the mark of your veteran on the Medicaid form. Mm -hmm. So they're out, they're sending out the forms that say, you know, email or style, you know, go out to this link. But then we're also giving it to our staff just as kind of a follow-up in case we don't hear from Okay, them. so it's sending it out to the veterans and it's their responsibility to then follow up and try and enroll in VA. Right, veterans. we're trying to take them to the VA's doorstep, if you will, and then from there we expect the VA. But, okay, no one's making that contact to them to try and bring them in, they need to finish the... Well, when the, when the DVS is a notified that there's been a veteran applicant, um, there's an automated like, email or something, but also the staff can contact them directly saying, hey, you see that you've um, enrolled in Medicaid, but did you know that you actually have, you potentially could have options to the VA? And that's kind of how that direct contact would work. Now we realize that a big problem with the situation as it stands now is veterans are simply just not aware of veteran services. So this is the point of having the direct contact, just to simply inform them. It's the, and also, I'm sorry, to answer your question, who is actually doing this? This is the Division of Veteran Services. So in this flowchart here, the Veterans First is the online interface that automatically, they don't have to do anything, catches their information and sends it to DVS. And DVS is in charge of the outreach and the PR campaign. A uh, quick question on your projections of cost savings and um, the amount of people that you'll be able to enroll. Um, what are you, what assumptions have you made around the growth in the number of veterans? So how are you projecting out for the out years? So what this is showing is the block of veterans in the system right now over time. So it's not necessarily taking into account the new veterans that are coming in because our system is working to reach them before they get on Medicaid. But this is sort of the response, okay, they're on Medicaid now. And our sample showed us that 80% of those should be eligible through the VA. So what do we do with them now? And so what we assumed was about 25% growth for the first couple of years, went up and capped out around 40%. So taking the total left over, taking 40%, and then went down dramatically to maybe like 10% in the last couple of years. Is that the question? I don't know. 
Um, can I, could you roll back to slide eight? We're probably not going to get to my question on slide eight, but um, I'm a little foggy on roles and responsibilities. You use like we and our a lot, and I'm, you're Deloitte, and you mentioned that you're going to hire Bill from Washington. Is is that correct, or are you recommending that we as state hire Bill? We apologize for that miscommunication. We um, encourage you that Bill will be a great asset to this process to encourage the HIC to go and, and uh, hire him to come be a advocate and a consultant to how to actually integrate the system. Okay, and this is a multi-part question. Um, <laughs> the second part of the question is also around hiring. You mentioned that we will hire students. Again, um, are you recommend are you Deloitte hiring students directly or are you recommending that we the state hire students? The state. Okay. Um, you also mentioned some uh, build of an interface, which kind of raised the larger question. If you could kind of succinctly describe them, what is Deloitte's role in the project and what do you require of the state? So ultimately, based on our contract, we would like to be able to see this through. This is a very important project, and we have done work with other states with Medicaid, um, but it really depends on the, the terms of our contract and how much really you want us to help you. Um, we're here to help as much as we can, get the resources that we have, but it really comes down to what you want and what your needs are. And so we would start more at the beginning, but we're trying to make this as you know, cost effective over time as possible. That's why we did so much with the automating because we don't want the burden to be so heavy on the state going forward. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.